Thank you. Um, I'm Shu Sen Wang. I'm from uh, Stevens Institute of Technology. I'm going to talk about matrix sketching for secure collaborative learning. Uh, I love theory, but in this talk, I just use matrix sketching for an application. I, I want to prove some theory, but I haven't made it. So no theory in my talk. Um, uh, what, what is uh, collaborative machine learning? I would like to give two motivating examples. Uh, federal, uh, it's also known as federal learning. Federal learning was proposed by Google. Uh, here's the motivation. Google wants to train a model using users' mobile data. Um, so a uh, straightforward solution is to collect users' data and train a model on the server. It's easy. However, the challenge is if, if users um, do not want to upload the data to Google, especially the sensitive data, then how can Google train such a, such a model? Uh, another example is uh, consider several hospitals want to tr jointly train a model. A uh, jointly train a model is, of course, better than a uh, train a model using one's own data. Uh, so they have the motivation to collaborate. Uh, a possible solution is also centralized learning. They can aggregate the data, give the data to one hospital or to a third party, and then train a model on the server. Um, the challenge is also privacy. Uh, laws or policies may forbid giving patients' data to others. Uh, so patients' data may, may not be allowed to leave the server. Um, collaborative machine learning is also known as federal learning. Here's a basic idea of, fed, uh, of collaborative learning. Um, there's a central parameter server. Uh, in every iteration, the server sends the model parameters to all the user devices. Then the oh, what's happening? Um, then the user devices use uh, use the model parameters and their local data to compute some ascending directions, um, like a gradient. Then the server aggregates the ascending directions and use. So the server can aggregate the ascending directions and use them to update the model parameters. Okay. So the the server send the model parameters the updated model parameters to the, to the user devices so they can start the next iteration. Uh, it continues in this way, and in the end, the server will, uh, will train a model uh, using all the data, but without actually accessing the data. Um, collaborative machine learning is a hot research topic. Uh, I think there are basically two research directions. One is communication efficiency. Um, there have been a whole bunch of paper on communication efficient federal learning. Uh, Peter talked about one uh, algorithm, and Peter has like a dozen papers on communication efficient federal learning. <laughs> and another research direction is, uh, is security in, federal, uh, in collaborative learning. Uh, there, uh, there are some papers, and now it's, it's getting some uh, attention. <laughs> okay, so another line of research is security. Uh, this, uh, my talk is about uh, security in collaborative machine learning. Um, so question, does collaborative machine learning protect uh, privacy? Uh, it seems to because um, collaborative machine learning avoids collecting users' data. Um, the jointly trained model by the data do not leave users' devices. So users' privacy is seemingly protected. But really, if a machine learning model is useful, it must reveal information about the data on which it was trained. So. Um, the training data can, can be reversely inferred from the model. There's an attack called model inversion attack. Um, it can infer some uh, information about the data, uh, but it does not work very well. Um, but in collaborative machine learning, it's easier to conduct the attack. Um, for the model inversion attack, they just have the finally trained model. But in collaborative machine learning, they have everything. It, they have all the gradients and all the model parameters. So it's, mu it's much easier to conduct an attack. Um, in collaborative machine learning, gradients and the model parameters can leak users' data. There have been two papers on, on this, uh, on this uh, topic. Excuse me, I'll set up parameters on this one. How can a gradient leak data? Oh, I, I will talk about it later. Um, so how is privacy disclosed? Uh, let's consider a simplified situation. They are just a uh, two parties, the two users want to jointly train a model. In every iteration, the server sends the model parameters wo to the users. Um, then the users use the local data to compute a gradient uh, or some other descend ascending direction. Then the server takes the average or sum of the ascending directions and use them to update the model parameters and get w new. 
then the server send w new to the two users. So user one knows w new and w old because the server broadcast the, the two model parameters to, to them. Uh, user one also knows delta one. Delta one is, is computed by user one. So using this equation, user one knows delta two. What is delta two? Delta two is a, is a ascending direction computed on the data of user two. Uh, assume user one is a bad guy. He wants to infer the, infer the data of user two. User two is a victim. Uh, what can he do? Um, this paper published in this year um, is on a top a computer security conference. Um, they use a very simple method. Uh, they take the, they take the uh, gradient as the input features and directly put it uh, in a to a classifier like SVM. Then the classifier can predict some properties like uh, whether this user is Asian, whether, his, uh, whether uh, the user is female, uh, if this is a hospital, then whether they have patients with HIV. So they do, not, they, they do not know the exact data, but they can infer some properties. It's called property inference attack. But it uses the model information also, right? uh, No, no, no. It's irrelevant to the model. It, they just take the, it, they just take the um, gradient as the features and train a SVM on it. It's, it's, uh, this classifier is irrelevant to the model. Uh, miraculously, it works, and uh, the accuracy is frighteningly high. Uh, what if there are more than two users? If there are more than two users, then, uh, then the evil user cannot infer the gradient of user two. Instead, he can just know the sum of the other user's gradients. So he, he, he won't be able to, use, uh, to infer user two's information. Instead, he can know uh, if there are hospitals, then Maybe some hospitals have patients with rare disease and the patient is African-American. He can know such kind of information. Um, and of course, the server sees all the gradients. So those, if the server is evil, then nothing is, is safe. But uh, it may not be a problem because we typically trust the server. Um, in, the, in the original paper, they just uh, mentioned the, the centralized collaborative learning. Um, but I realize that the, the situation is the same in decentralized machine learning. In decentralized machine learning, there isn't a central parameter server. Um, there, are, there are many work, work nodes. Um, they hold a, a copy of parameters. They use their local data to update the parameters. Um, and they need to communicate so they can converge to the same point. They need to get the parameters from the neighbors. Um, so um, the difference between two consecutive parameters is roughly the neighbor's gradient. So in this way, a bad guy can also know his, can, can know his neighbor's gradients, and he can conduct the same attack to infer his neighbor's data. Um, so let's go back to the motivation of uh, collaborative machine learning. Uh, the motivation is to jointly train a model without data sharing, so the privacy will be protected. Um, however, the disturbing fact is the server and users can infer some other users' properties. And the victim does not even notice a, pri a privacy leakage. Um, the pr the uh, property inference attack is passive. Uh, they just, uh, they just uh, use the information the server gave them, and they do not manipulate the gradients. And in this way, they can infer lots of information, and the victim do not notice it. Um, so a question, can the attacks be easily defended? When it comes to uh, privacy leakage, people can easily think of differential privacy. Um, differential privacy adds random noise to gradients, parameters, or data. But uh, in, in, machine, uh, in machine learning, they typically add noise to the gradients. Um, however, um, it doesn't work, uh, work because if the noise is weak, then it does not protect privacy. If the noise is strong, then it will, then it will stop the progress of collaborative learning, or at least uh, it will make the, the accuracy drop a lot. It actually has a theoretical explanation. Uh, you know, in differential privacy, there's a failure probability, but it's iterative. If, if you repeat it a thousand times, then the failure probability will go up a thousand times, and it will fail. So I don't think differential privacy will work in this case. Uh, another um, simple uh, defense is dropout. 
Uh, what's job out? Uh, let's consider a fully connected layer. X is the input matrix, W is the width matrix. Um, the, uh, it computes the product of X by W transpose and then apply an activation function on the product. Uh, job out randomly mask half of the half of the features uh, and scale the, the rest by a factor of two. It's just like uniform sampling. Uh, it, use, it do the approximate matrix multiplication, and the result is not too far away from the original because it's uniform sampling. Uh, dropout is, uh, is used as a regularization. Uh, using dropout, the, user, uh, the server will send masked parameters to the users, and the users will uh, use the masked uh, parameters to compute gradient, and the gradient is automatically masked. So in this way, um, the user will release less information. Um, so, however, it's not safe. User one knows the masked parameters um, of W old and W new. Um, suppose 50% are randomly masked. So user one uh, still, still knows 25% um, uh, because they have uh, an overlap. So user one can infer 25% of the difference delta. And user one knows his own gradient, G1. So user one knows 25% of G2 using this equation. Um, using, using the 25% um, information, um, the gradient can, can leak information regarding the 25% features like uh, race, gender, disease, and so on. So job out, uh, it may work, but it does not work very well. Um, unfortunately, the attacks are easy to conduct, but very hard to defend. Uh, this paper by Malice and others used uh, gradients to attack collaborative machine learning, and they showed simple defenses do not work. This attack is passive. They, just, they don't manipulate the data or the gradients. They just, uh, uh, do, uh, they just behave as a normal participant. <coughs> There's an earlier work by my colleagues. Um, they use model parameters to attack collaborative learning. They build again, used again to generate other users' data. Um, and they, they show the simple defenses do not work either. Uh, but this attack may be easier to defend because it's active. They must manipulate the gradients. They, um, they send some fake information to the server, so it's possible to detect it and, and defend the attack. Uh, so I think the former one is harder to defend. So why is there, it's described like there's a good guy and a bad guy. Um, why, why aren't they both sort of, um, like, because clearly if you're doing differential privacy, you're sending a bunch of noise, you know, wash stuff out. So that's not surprising that one. Or, 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 is there a way to have them both be, you know, utility maximizing and, and get some sort of e equilibrium state where, you know, they, they inject information in sort of a directed way rather than a massive amount of random noise? Okay, it, you, and noise, you must trade off the utility and the privacy. But right, here, here. Do something like that. So add, add, add the, the quote noise in a much more directed way. So you don't have this massive ball of noise like differential privacy, but add in a much more directed way and, and look at that trade off. Um, Is that not something people do? I don't know. They try differential privacy, it doesn't work. But that's because you just add a, that's like adding gradient noise. You just add a bunch of noise. Uh -huh. It's not at all targeted or directed. And so you know, it's not surprising you're going to wash out structure before and, and, and stagnate say, before it gets useful. When you say differential privacy doesn't work, I mean, differential privacy is not a method, right? It's a certain guarantee that a method can have. So are you saying that any method that will have oh, OK, OK, of course it can work. You, you just replace our data with random noise, and they can infer nothing. But you will learn nothing. So there's a trade-off. If you want to learn something, you can't, you can't uh, add lots of noise. So if you don't want your accuracy job to drop several percents, then you cannot add too, too strong noise. And uh, it will fail. And they can still infer a lot of information from the data. And Th that's a trade off. experimentally or somewhat theoretically? Or uh, experimentally, they showed uh, it doesn't work. But theoretically, there's a failure probability. It's iterative. If it repeats a thousand times, then the failure probability go up a thousand times. So theoretically, I don't think it can work. I'm pretty yeah, sure that basically there's a privacy budget. My, my intuition is that you, you need up a lot of privacy budget by adding just naive random noise. But if you had added it in a much more targeted way, you'd likely use up a lot less of the privacy I budget, mean, maybe be easily more precise. I, I'm, I'm certainly not, not an expert on this, but I mean, I, I feel like there, there is iterative methods of differential privacy that do not, 
completely, that where the, the, the private project does not completely scale with the number of iterations. Right? What's so that the question? question? So one comment I wanted to make is, so the, the distributed methods I did not talk about in my talk, uh, they had this uh, peculiar property that you could uh, quantize or compress up to the level mm -hmm. of the number of nodes. And that doesn't decrease the overall number of communication, uh, increase the number of communications. So if you had more participating parties, you could, you could add a lot of noise and it doesn't uh, hurt the performance. So there's now a bunch of papers that you say more stuff. More part, more machine, more, more machines. You can quantize more aggressively. So you can, you can quantize as aggressively uh, as the number of uh, nodes. So the variance of the quantization could be as large as that. It doesn't hurt the performance of the overall work. So it's, it's surprising, but it's true. So, so this is a suggestion that maybe there's something. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm kind of working on it. This work is just halfway done. Uh, so uh, let's go, uh, go back to matrix sketching. I'm going to use matrix sketching to defend, uh, to defend the attack. Uh, so uh, you are familiar with matrix sketching. It, it converts a big matrix to a smaller one by applying a so-called sketching matrix to X. Uh, sketching matrix can be random sampling, it can also be random projection. Um, so, uh, I think matrix sketching can be an alternative to differential privacy in some applications. Here's an example. If the original data is age, gender, race, height, and income, if you do random sampling, you, you will get uh, like uh, age, race, and height. It, it can release some information. But if you do random projection, you get age minus race minus income. The other entry is gender plus height. It's not understandable to human. Um, it's, from, um, uh, it's from Mahoney and Jenny's paper. Um, they argue that they want to use random sampling because, uh, because random sampling is understandable to human expert if you construct the basis using random sampling. Uh, but in this, uh, in this application, we have the opposite mo uh, motivation. We want to do random projection. So they cannot infer much from the sketch. Um, matrix sketching, okay. Uh, given the sketch, uh, so okay, W is a parameter matrix and S is a sketching matrix. Doing the sketch, sketching, we got W tilde. If we have W tilde and S, they are both small, uh, small matrices. Um, if, if S is a random projection matrix, then one cannot recover W, the big matrix. Uh, however, if S is a uniform sampling matrix, then one can still recover part of W. Um, it's, uh, I think it's true, but I, I can't prove it theoretically. Um, so similarly, uh, given uh, W1, W2 are the parameters in two iterations, if we apply different sketching to W1 and W2 using S1 and S2, we will get two, um, two sketches, W2.1 and W2.2. Um, the evil user has W2.1, W2.2, and the sketching matrices S1 and S2. However, with them, I don't think they can recover the difference between, between the real parameters W1 and W2. Uh, I can't prove it, and, and now I'm trying to do it using some information theory or linear algebra, but currently no theory. And I, I can't think of a way to, to, recover, to recover delta, even approximately. Why does the first we have the sketching matrices? Okay, um, the, uh, the uh, user must, must have the sketching matrices in order to produce, uh, to, in, in order to perform a forward pass and backward pass. I will talk about it later. So are you asking about W1 and W2? Pardon? Are you making any assumptions on W1 and W2? Um, in, of course, it's in realistic settings, W1 and W2 can, cannot be zeros. They are model parameters. They should be this should be bigger than delta. Well, I mean, if but you I want mean, to recover W1 from W1 tilde and S1, that, that corresponds to solving a linear system, right? Then you ask yourself, why does a linear system have a unique solution? Uh, it has a solution. However, a uh, this is a small matrix. This is a small matrix. You cannot recover a big matrix. So, so why? So isn't that a proof that you can't recover? Um, I want to prove it, but now I, I, I don't know how. But it's group it about this 
So do you want to establish so, so what, what exactly do you want to guarantee on yeah. this or a weaker kind of guarantee? Uh, I want to guarantee if you have the four small matrices, you cannot recover W1. Exactly. Yeah, I want to prove this, but it's now I, it's, it's not a well-defined problem. I, I don't know how to it's do it. It's a linear system. It's well, it's too far away. I try it. It doesn't, it's not useful what is the by solving the linear system. Oh, well, I think the linear system doesn't have a unique solution. Of course you don't get it. <laughs> okay. No, but, but I think the point here, when he says recover, it's not about recover. There's some information leakage still. Yeah, there's some information, yeah. Uh, if if, we, if uh, scattered matrices are uniform sampling, then we can, we can re recover part of delta. However, if it's random random projection, then I don't think I can re recover yeah, anything. Because multiplication should, it's not like keying, right? Because when you add random, you, you kill it. But if you multiply, you don't kill it completely. So there should still be correlation. Yeah, yeah, I believe there's correlation, but the, the problem is how to recover, recover it. I mean, can, can you define recovery more? I mean, so like, we're... Oh, I mean, uh, recover, like we need to know roughly, roughly uh, what is delta in order to get the other, the other user's gradient. If, if the recovered delta is too far away, then um, the noise is, is stronger than signal, then there, I mean, there's if, nothing we can infer. So if W1 minus W2 is sparse, then, then maybe you can recover? Um, model parameters are typically not sparse. Okay, if they are zeros, then we can recover part of it. But they are, they are far away from zeros, and they are W1 and W2 are both much larger than delta. That's a problem. So it's, it's not a well-defined problem yet. I'm thinking of it, but I don't know how, how to solve it. But why do, you, what's this, why do you want to recover it? I mean, even if you don't recover it exactly, and you get something that's pretty close, you're going to leak information. Yeah. So the pipeline you feed it into is going to still be a problem. So and if you iterate, it's each, each time yeah. it's more. And if you have side information, <coughs> then it, it might just kill your problem. Yeah. yeah. Um, so this is why our proposal method can defend the proper inference. If, if the evil user does not have delta, then he cannot infer others' uh, gradient. But I mean, if he has an approximation. OK, I, I tried different methods. And I, OK, my <coughs> results are not meaningful. I don't know how to do it now. And I want to prove I cannot do it, but it's not a well-defined problem. But maybe you can find the bound, then. If you find like an information leakage bound, you don't leak more than this, then, then maybe you can then say something using that, right? Like, I will not leak more than this, and then Yeah, yeah, you can I, see think, how it I think it's, a, it's an interesting problem, so I want to bring up it mm -hmm. here. Do you know, I mean, say you don't get whatever exactly, in the pipeline you feed it into, what, I mean, maybe if you have it exactly, that suffices for what you want to do oh, later. Okay. What, what's, the, what's the minimalist sort of sufficient condition on, you know? You no, it's just not a well-defined problem. Uh, I don't really know. <coughs> Sorry, I missed the first part of the talk. So I want things like you you want like prevent the privacy like from some like attackers. Yeah, so I, I don't want anyone to anyone to get delta. Yeah, since we are like looking like when you update your model, you are looking like a batch of different data, right? So when you get this like W it's, it's already like an average of like different like, uh, like patient like information. How can you like attack only like the gradient and that like, gets each individual's like uh, like information? Oh we can tell you about later. I have many slides to go. <laughs> okay, a matrix sketching has uh, some nice properties. Uh, if, okay, we can apply any matrix to, to W to, to make it random so people cannot infer anything meaningful. However, we need some nice properties of matrix sketching so it does not hurt the prediction accuracy. Um, so there are some nice properties of uh, matrix sketching. For example, it's unbiased. Um, so, if we apply sketching to every layer of a neural network, then the output will not differ too much. That's the idea of dropout. Dropout use uh, uniform sampling. Uh, I want to mention uh, uh, my proposed method is different from uh, Peter's gradient sketch. It looks similar, but it's actually different. Uh, my, uh, our method um, approximate the, do the approximation in the forward pass. We sketch the input and the parameters then we derive the gradient according to the churn rule, uh, its back propagation. Then uh, in the back propagation, the gradients are automatically sketched, but it's different from apply as to the true gradients, different. Um, it's similar, uh, our method is similar to job out. I've tried this method, um, but it doesn't work well. I guess I didn't, I didn't apply variance reduction, that's why. I have some uh, additional work on sketching the X, so the W. 
Oh, didn't talk about it. Oh, really? Yeah. We can talk later. Um, in Peter's uh, in Peter's talk, he, he uh, mentioned gradient sketch. Uh, he directly apply a sketch matrix to gradient, um, and use it to update the model. Uh, here's my proposed defense. Um, so Is, is sitting in a distributed way on these edge, edge machines, for example, and the, and the gradient is, and you're sketching, he, he's sketching the gradient and sending it back, but you're, you're, you're sketching W and keeping it, or you're sending it back, or what? I'll, I will talk about it. Uh, okay, how's privacy disclosed? I think the problem is the server sends all the parameters to the user, so the users have access to the true parameters, and uh, the users, directly release their gradients to the server, and uh, the gradients carry their information. So I propose double-blind collaborative machine learning, that we call. Um, <laughs> a server does not uh, see the gradients. Instead, users send sketched gradients to the server. I call it sketched gradients, but it's different from Peter's sketched gradients. Um, users do not see the model parameters. Instead, a server sends sketched parameters to the users. Um, okay. Has this been published? Um, no, uh, all, uh, a draft is almost done. No, that's good. I'll, I'll talk quickly about the next. This is how federated learning is done at the moment. Pardon? This is how it's done at the moment in production. <laughs> <laughs> Just like yours. <laughs> okay. The server sends sketched parameters to the users. The u throughout the, the learning, user has never seen the true parameters. They just see the sketch gradients, uh, sketched parameters and the sketch matrix will change with iteration. Then the users will um, send sketched gradients back to the server. Um, they are, I call them sketched gradients because I didn't realize Peter's work, but my sketch gradient is not directly applied as to G. Um, then the server will use the sketched gradients to update the model parameters. Um, the sketch gradients are smaller, so the size do not match. So there must be some transformation to make the size match um, it, it's it's uh, obtained by uh, matrix differentiation. Uh, after the update, the server will um, uh, sketch the sketch the new parameter using another sketch matrix and send it to the users. So user one knows um, the sketch of the parameters. User one must know the the sketch matrices so he can uh, he can do the forward pass and backward pass. Um, but from the smaller matrices, they cannot recover the big matrices, um, especially when it is a uh, random projection matrix. So user one cannot infer uh, G2 or a sketch of G2. So in this way, it's safe. Um, so um, WCO can, per, uh, can, defend, can defend the property inference attack. But uh, can it defend other attacks? It's yet unclear, I'm still doing it. It's very easy to empirically show an attack works, but it's hard to show an attack doesn't work. If I tried it and it doesn't work, maybe the problem is mine. I cannot claim it doesn't work. So currently it's unclear. Um, it can also be applied to decentralized machine learning uh, rather straightforwardly. Uh, in decentralized machine learning, uh, they send parameters to each other. So instead of sending parameters, they should send sketch parameters and, uh, and vary the sketching matrix with iteration. So uh, a user cannot infer other users' gradients. Um, okay, it's, it's very easy to, per, to, to uh, come up with a defense. You can just, you can just uh, replace your data with random noise and they, they will learn nothing about your privacy, but it will hurt the, um, the training and uh, prediction accuracy. Um, the nice thing about WCO is that it has very little extra cost. Um, it does not hurt the prediction accuracy because it's basically the same to job out. Uh, in job out, uh, they apply a uniform sampling to the input and the weight matrix and then apply an activation function on the approximate product. Um, since uh, other sketching methods have very similar property as Uniform sampling, so they should be uh, so we should be able to apply them instead of uniform sampling. Uh, I've tried Gaussian projection and count sketch, 
Uh, Khan sketch works very well, but it's still uh, slower than drop out in terms of iterations. I don't know why. I tried Gaussian projection. It's even slower. I don't. <laughs> I have no idea why it happens. They should have this, the same performance, but I, it's it's a it's a mystery to me. Why why are you describing this in terms of the differential stuff as opposed because dropout. I don't know if I've read the actual paper, but I, I, I don't think it's described. It's just described as a way to regularize and so on. Um, yeah. Are, are you a plug-in for that? In which case, why is there this? Okay, okay. I have thought of uh, Peter's idea, applying sketching to gradient and the parameters. I thought is, I've I got this idea a long time ago. I tried, doesn't work well. And it puzzled me a long time because I didn't know variance reduction. Then uh, finally, I, make it my, I made it work because I realized the connection between dropout and sketching. Then I made it converge. Um, the idea why it converges is because of dropout. Everyone knows dropout works well. If I replace a uniform sampling by random projection, it should work. And it actually works, but still slower than dropout, but not too slow. Um, here's an experiment on uh, convolution in your network. It's, it's slower, but is it uh, any better? Or? Um, no, it's basically it's the same accuracy. Here's the plot. I tried a convolutional neural network. I sketched the convolutional layers and fully connected layers. Uh, convolutional layers can be thought of as matrix multiplication because you can do patching and reshape the patches to vectors. And you also reshape the filters to vectors and you apply it as a matrix multiplication. In this way, I can apply sketching to convolutional layers. Uh, here's uh, the experiments on MNIST data set. Uh, the x-axis is the epochs and the y-axis is uh, uh, is a, tr a training and validation error. After 17 epochs, the error drops below 1%. And uh, after more epochs, it will, uh, it's kept below 0.8% error, I mean. So it, it matches the best performance. So it means if I use sketching, it does not hurt accuracy. Uh, and of course, it, uh, it alleviates overfitting. If I don't apply, uh, regularization, the validation error may go up a little bit. And uh, WCO does not increase time complexity. Uh, OK, I don't need to explain because you, you know it very well. If I <laughs> apply count sketch to the matrix multiplication, then the time complexity ad actually goes down a little bit. And uh, WCO does not increase communication cost. Uh, in principle, they must agree upon the sketching matrix and it changes with iteration. Uh, however, we don't need to send the sketching matrices. We just need to send an integer. It's a random seed. If, if all of them have the same random seed and have the, the same pseudo-random generator, um, then they will have the same sketching matrices. So it does not increase communication cost. Uh, let me summarize. Pardon? It may increase the number of communities. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, it does not increase uh, per iteration complexity. Uh, but it increases the number of iterations, as I mentioned. Maybe double or triple. Uh, summary, uh, collaborative machine learning can be unsafe. Uh, the motivation of collaborative machine learning is, uh, is to jointly train a model without data sharing. Data never leave a user's device, so it's seemingly safe. However, model parameters and gradients can carry users' privacy. And there are ways to, to attack. Um, and uh, the prior works uh, try simple defenses like dropout and differential privacy, and they do not work. Uh, so I propose a method called WCO. Um, it can defend the property inference attack. I'm not sure whether it can defend other types of attacks. Um, the nice thing is it has almost no extra cost. Uh, the perturation time complexity and communication complexity remain the same. It does not harm prediction accuracy. It reasonably increases the number of iterations, like uh, uh, twice more or three times more, but it's fine. Just like dropout. Dropout also increases the number of iterations. But people use dropout because it improves generalization. So um, increasing the number of iterations may not be a big issue. Um, this work may bring some insights for randomized linear algebra. Uh, I think sketching may be an alternative to differential privacy in some applications. Differential privacy is not really clever. It ra at, ra at random noise, it can protect privacy, but it sacrifices accuracy and, uh, and uh, efficiency. 
if we apply ran random sketching in the right way, it can protect uh, privacy to some extent and it does not affect accuracy and efficiency. Okay. Lowering approximation via sketching and showing that it's differentially private, or Johnson Linen's trust from a preserved privacy. Like, how do these fit into? Oh, re really? I, I I'm not aware of that. Do you uh, tell me? Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, I can talk about that. Sure. Thank you. Um, so in in I guess <laughs> in your model, I I guess the, the the fact that differential privacy you say is difficult to use is because. Is, this, is that right? Is that because at every stage, sort of like if at every stage of your collaborative ML, you want to be sort of private at every stage, right? Yeah. It's not like the end result model is has to be private. In every iteration, you must be private because this time you use this batch of data, you get a gradient. Next time you use another batch of data, you must protect every batch. So if you repeat it a thousand times, they'll fill up properly. And the <coughs> users see, I guess, the, the effect of the next iteration in the next stage, right? So I guess, okay. maybe, I'm not sure. <laughs>